Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Leighton Brown, the master of McLaughlin College, and I want to welcome all of you to or back to McLaughlin College. As I will assume you all know, and so I'm only reminding you rather than telling you for the first time, they, the mandate or thematic focus of McLaughlin College is public policy. We are a college dedicated to the understanding and critical analysis of public policy. And it's in the spirit of that theme that I'm really excited to uh, introduce today's session. Some of you know, uh, and I will remind you and inform the others, that this is actually the second time that we've had the privilege of hearing from Olivia Chow. But it is the first time that she's actually spoken in McLaughlin College. Last year, uh, she was our speaker on International Women's Day. And we anticipated, correctly, a crowd too large to be accommodated in this particular room. And so we held that event in the Senate chamber, which was overflowing. We had originally scheduled Olivia Chow to speak on today's topic a little over a month ago. And those of you with any historical sense will realize that that was during the labor disruption and we had to postpone. That would have been in the Senate chamber as well. We are grateful to Olivia uh, that she was able to find time in her very busy schedule to to come back and speak to us on this terribly important topic today. Uh, I want to add just a couple of other procedural things before we will launch the session today. There are copies of Olivia's book available for sale in the back corner. Some of you I know have already got them. Uh, Olivia will have some time at the end of our session to autograph books if, if any of you would like uh, to ask her to do that. The second thing is, as you will have noticed, this session is being recorded and will be available on the McLaughlin College website for the people who would have liked to be here but were not able to on, on uh, this rescheduled occasion. That means when we get to the question and answer period, we would like you to ask your questions from a microphone. Otherwise, we will not be able to pick up the sound of the question on the recording. So when we get to that point, please go and, and line up uh, at the microphone. I think I have said all of the welcoming high-level things that it's necessary for me to say. I would like to call on the Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies here at York, Diane Woody, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, David. Um, welcome to everyone. It is my pleasure to be here in this role representing the um, outgoing dean of the faculty, Martin Singer, and the incoming dean, Ananya Mukherjee-Reed, who was announced on Monday. So you have a welcome, Olivia, ah. from two deans. <laughs> Double the fun. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I work with all four colleges in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, and I'm always um, thrilled when we have these kinds of events. The colleges are superb at creating a neighborhood, a community where faculty and students can come together. And as David mentioned, um, McLaughlin in particular has this mandate to explore issues that of, of public concern um, policy matters that affect all of us um, in this city, in this province, in this country. The, um, the other interesting thing about today's topic is that we do at York have a very strong program in children's studies and there's obviously a connection. So I just wanted to sort of park that in everyone's um, psyche because there's, there's some really interesting pieces that connect here. So Olivia, welcome. Um, she probably doesn't need an introduction 
for, for most of you, but it's probably worth remembering that she is part of, or has been part of a formidable duel with Jack Layton, and in her own right as a politician, has been a real force to be reckoned with, a voice of passion and commitment and concern. And most recently, she has a position as a distinguished visiting professor at Ryerson. So she has joined the ranks of the academy. And of course, that means, once you're an academic, that you're always prone to an ever-present danger, which is called analysis paralysis. However, when you look at this title, I don't think that's what we're in for. I think she'll successfully avoid the analysis paralysis and instead um, force us to think, she'll be provocative, if I, you know, my past experience listening to Olivia speak, um, she'll be provocative, thought-provoking, she'll be passionate, she'll be comprehensive, and she'll be probing. So I think we're in for a real treat, and don't forget that the last word on that slide is now. So she will be action-oriented as well. Please join me in welcoming Olivia Chow to the microphone. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Why do I use the word desperate? So imagine that, uh, yeah, I don't bite. I don't bite. It's high. <laughs> uh, imagine yourself 11, a 11 p.m. Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, those of you that it's a long weekend, you had a grand time. And you, Easter Monday is coming. 11 o'clock, you might be just finishing dinner, you can have a nice long rest, you might be watching Netflix, you might be doing something with your family. But a fellow, a guy, walked out of his home and he went and stood in line. Well, what was he stood, well, okay. 11 o'clock, he stood in line and he was waiting. So, well, but Boxing Day was over. What was he waiting for? Right? He's not waiting for some sales. Uh, he was waiting. He's lined up to get on a waiting list. Is the waiting list to get a nice iPad, iPod? Is it for the I iPhone 7 to come up? No. Um, he was waiting, and then it's now 3.30, outside, still a bit cold. There are now 12 people lined up and waiting. They have a few more hours to go before the sun comes out and the door of this place open. It's not Best Buy. And they're still waiting, and they're still waiting. Well, what are they waiting for? Well, let me tell you about what... Alicia stand, was standing in line at 3.30. She got there at 3.30. There were 12 people ahead of her. And they were tired. They were hungry. And the line kept growing. And more people were waiting. What was she doing? She, this is Kaylee. Kaylee, uh, I don't think my pointer works here. But Kaylee actually has six years old. Kaylee is uh, waiting to get on a waiting list for a spot in the wide MCA run before and after school daycare program at Ecole Harrison School. Whoa, okay, this is serious stuff. And she has been waiting and finally the door opened and she didn't get very far. So she said, <clears throat> this is exact word, this is what Alicia said. I waited in line to get her a spot in a program that's already full. That's kind of pathetic, isn't it? It's kind of pathetic. It's pathetic and desperate. We're so far behind, she said, that for me personally, it has been a deterrent from having more children. <clears throat> so family are actually slowing down. Some may actually not even get pregnant in order to have a kid because it's so expensive. That's pretty desperate. You know, you and I know when you, you really want a kid, you think, oh, well, I can't quite afford one. Maybe I won't have a kid. Okay? That's not good. And this is her line. 
When it comes to child care, there's a lot of desperate people out there, desperately waiting, desperately trying to figure out what to do with their kids. Now, Alicia is not alone. Right here in Toronto, you know how many people are on the waiting list for child care? 17,000. You look up Air Canada capacity, it's a bit of a blurry photo. That's Air Canada Centre, I think. Yeah, I think it is, or something like that. It's about 17,000 people. That's the number of kids waiting for childcare, affordable childcare, just here in Toronto. And it's happening all across the country. And it's not just today that it's gone so bad. It's been bad for a long, long time. I know there are some of you here it's been bad when your kid was young and now your kid had kids. You're now grandmom, grandfather. You still, the situation is still desperate. So 17,000 just here in Toronto alone. I'm not talking about GTA, just Toronto, 17,000. Now, this is my two grandchildren, Solace and Beatrice. Oh, you're supposed to say. <laughs> Cute, right? Jack Layton's grandkids. Um, so, when Beatrice, which is here with the pink, fluffy, lovely rabbit, when mom, Sarah Layton, got pregnant, oh, she told us about it. Tears of joy and excitement. We can't wait. It was so exciting. And then I said to her, Sarah, put your name on a waiting list, please. So, pardon? Well, you're going to have a kid. Are you going back to work? Yeah. She works at the uh, Stephen Lewis Foundation. Very good work. Organizing events for Stephen Lewis. Foundation. Very important work. She wants to go back to work. Well, I said, this is when the babe, when I just heard about her being pregnant, put your name on a waiting list because if you do it now, you might just get it when the kid gets to be about six months old or a year old. Thank God we did that. Also, Thank God she can afford it. Beatrice, Solace, their, their child care fees right now is more than the mortgage payment. <laughs> wow. Aha. Uh -huh. It's a lot of money. Okay, I'll go into that later on. That's why people are thinking, can I afford another kid? Now, I want to switch a story of my grandkids to a little story about uh, when I was a, uh, the first children advocate in the city of Toronto, I asked kids and young people all across Toronto, what would you do if you're in charge of the city? I don't know at that time, that was I think in the late 90s, a lot of kids like CN Tower, they like CN Tower, they drew some CN Tower, they like, huh, what, you want more CN Tower? Well, maybe not. And more parks, more, more place to play, one kid wrote something really interesting. She drew a little grocery bag. Her name is Sylvia. Sylvia is five years old. And the grocery bag has mom going like this. Dad, dad doesn't have a mouth. Maybe dad doesn't talk a lot. And three kids looking quite happy. But the words are not so happy. The words that she wanted to say was, I would ask God for more money to buy groceries. Hang on a second, think about this. More money, so you can imagine that this kid, five-year-old kid, would have an opportunity where mom or dad didn't have enough money to buy groceries. What does that mean? That means the family didn't have a lot of money, living in poverty, that Sylvia 
might have gone to bed hungry. That's absurd. In this city of ours that are so rich, I keep seeing bands these days. I don't know why. Maybe it's in that neighborhood. I don't know. They, they are people that can afford a lot of money. That kids have to pray to God for more money for groceries. There's something really wrong. Something desperately wrong. And think about this. Sylvia, now this is, I think it was 90-something. Sylvia by now is 23. <laughs> it's a long time ago. I was a city advocate, children's advocate. And at the time during 94, 93, that was the year that when Sylvia uh, was just being conceived, because it was five years before, I, yeah, at that time, she was about to be born. In 1993, there was this spectacular campaign promise. There was a red book. The government of the time that were running for election said, we will have a national child care program. I think that was Chrétien? Yes, okay. Oh, okay, some of you remember. And there was the Red Book 1, and then there was Red Book 2, and then Red Book 2 said, we will have a national child care program. There was Red Book 3, still no child care program. Right now, Sylvia would have been 23, probably thinking about having a kid of her by herself, like thinking about having, she might be married. I don't know, I'm not in touch with Sylvia. And, and, and the whole generation of kids have been raised. Why is child care, affordable child care, very important? Because when mom can work, when dad can work, without having to pay a huge amount of money, they can find enough money, perhaps, to lift themselves out of poverty. And that breaks the cycle of poverty. And child care can do that. Not just for middle class kids like my grandchildren, but also for parents of Sylvia's. Lots of parents needing it. So we are all desperately waiting. We are tired of waiting. We don't want to wait any longer because there's something that just doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. Why doesn't it, why doesn't it work? Because what we have now is a crisis. There's no debate about it. It's a crisis when you have so many kids waiting for childcare. It's also a patchwork system. Some people have grandparents that can care of them. Some is mom, neighborhood, neighborhood uh, babysitters. There is uh, sometimes it could be a family resource center. Some of the child care would be this before school. Some after school, after school activities, and the, whoa, it's all over the place. And it's almost depending on your luck. If you're lucky, you may get child care. It's like winning a lottery. In fact, parents have said to me, Olivia, I just got, I just got in. My kid got in. It's like winning the lottery. Kids do not. You hear it very often. It's like winning a lottery. It feels like it's a luck. It's a patchwork. I don't know. I don't go around carrying a hundred dollar bill. I was going to wave it around. You know how much it costs for child care per day? A hundred dollar a day. A hundred dollar. Think of how much you can do. How much, what kind of things you can buy with a hundred dollar a day. How much would that be a month? Quick, a year. It's about two thousand dollar a month. A year because there's summer involved. Maybe twenty thousand, twenty four thousand dollars. If you have two kids, no wonder it is higher than your mortgage. Sometimes, right? It's hugely expensive, sky high fee. And the quality is not very even. It depends on your luck again. Sometimes you get good quality, other times there isn't because it's not regulated. And the workforce are undervalued. When I was a city councilor back then, I looked at the salary of uh, a police officer or a person that pick up the garbage versus the salary of a child care worker, you know where I'm going. You know who has higher salary, right? Who has the lowest? Child care workers. In fact, we have child care workers that said, I can't have a second kid. 
I take care of kids. I can't afford a second kid because their salary is too low for them to afford to pay child care fees for the second kid. And it's even worse if you're indigenous people, if you live in rural Canada, if you don't have, uh, if, or if you have uh, some kind of disability, or if you're a little baby, because the waiting list is longest when you're a baby because it's most expensive. So things are pretty desperate, but it doesn't have to be that way. But think about it. Why is it that what we don't have doesn't work. Why? Well, because we don't spend any money on it. The OECD data said 0.25% of the GDP is what we spend. It's sort of lowest on the OECD totem pole. We have the lowest in terms of, of, of uh, country around the world. It is one of the lowest in terms of our spending. There's a huge gap. Don't compare us with any a lot of other countries because they spend a lot more. And it's not a market. What does that mean? Well, it's the, the funds are limited. You fund the parents, you know, that universal child care allowance check. And it's private responsibility. When I put out a tweet saying that I'm going to come here to talk about child care, I got some really weird tweets back. Can't afford it, don't have it. It's your own responsibility. It's your own. It's your kid. You take care of it. What you, I, should, I, I know, I, I got quite a, quite a lot of, uh, well, you know why? Because there's a notion that if you're nurturing someone, then because it's mostly a female responsibility, it's a private, not public, private, a family, your own decision. Therefore, the state should have nothing to do with it. Now, no one ever said that we don't, need police officer, that we don't need someone to protect us, that we don't need an army. So anything that is protecting us, we never say that we should not get the government involved. But somehow, when it is nurturing, when it is supporting seniors, supporting kids, because nurturing is more female, you know, just volunteer yourself. It's your, the, the state doesn't really have much responsibility. It's a really, uh, it's a very gendered analysis that we need to challenge. And as a result, the federal government said, we don't want to have any role in playing, therefore there's no public policy. A few years ago, when I was a member of parliament, I tried to have a National Child Care Act. It's Early Learning Child Care Act. We got it through the committees, we got it through second reading. When it came to the third reading, we didn't quite get the vote. <clears throat> because the conservative government said, we don't need any policy. Parents can figure it out. Parents knows best. Well, yeah, a parent knows best, but parents need to find a way to support the kids. In terms of provincial and territorials, they have very weak policies. So as a result, things are not working. But it doesn't need to be so desperate. You and I know that. Aha, you notice, brighter, a lot brighter. The sun is out. It is getting warmer. And we can make a difference. And can I?
This gives us limited options, unregulated care, sky high fees for parents, and low wages for educators. This is especially true for infants, children with disabilities, rural and indigenous communities, and parents with non-standard work schedules. There have been calls for high-quality, affordable child care for more than 40 years. In that time, Canada has moved no closer to having the universal child care system we need. Even though Canada is one of the world's wealthiest countries, we rank at the bottom of developed nations for early childhood education and child care options. But we can change that. And we know what we need to make it happen. A national policy framework and funding strategies. Services designed by each province and territory. Local management and planning. And a voice for parents and early childhood educators. Access to child care is not just a parent's responsibility. It's a human right recognized by the United Nations and enshrined in law by many countries around the world. Affordable child care and early childhood education underpin the principles that make us strong. Equity, collective responsibility, and providing our children with the best start in life. Let's make universal child care a reality by 2020. Critics say we can't afford to do this, but the truth is, we can afford not to. Can I trouble you to put us back? <laughs> wow, okay, we feel better? It's possible, isn't it? It's not that complicated. What is lacking is, what is lacking? A will, political will. It's funny because when you survey the people, the people said that we want childcare. We want a national child care program. So every poll I've always like over 75%. And yet it doesn't happen. But it could. Now before I go into how it could, a few principles. And I've just bought oh, right here. What we can do is to have make sure that we have uh, policies that are child center that we put the kids in the, so we, when we design programs, we need to make sure it is child-centered. We want to make sure that it's integrated with schools so that you don't have to take the child care, like, you know, you take it to the child care center, and then the school start, you then take it to the school, and then the school end, you then have to take it to the child care center. They needs to be connected that maybe an adult can take the kids if it has to be a different place, so that a mom doesn't have to like, take the kids and be like, well, you're working. How are you going to be able to do that? That doesn't work. And it needs to be seamless in the way that the policy is integrated so that, that there's some connection between the schools and the child care centers. And we also want to involve the parents. And, um, that, which is also very important. So what is the building block of uh, the universal child care? We heard it earlier. National Pro Policy Framework, an act of some kind, just like the Health Care Act. The fact that we can go to the doctor without having to pay because there's a National Health Act, okay? That is enshrined in law in Parliament. What we need to do when we are talking about a national policy, you need to enshrine it into a policy framework. Number one. Number two, you need to have long-term sustainable funding. Funding, where did the money come from? Well, it's our taxes. We just heard the budget recently, right? And did the budget give us a national child care program? No. Okay. Uh, and, well, we need sustainable funding, policy framework. We also need to be collaborative, bringing local government plus uh, parents, educators, the provinces, all coming together to design the best child care program. Now, there is a golden opportunity. When, you are, when we are thinking about strategy, there are three things that are most important. Tactics. What tactics do you use? Timing. Timing, opportunity, and who you have as your resources. We have people, we have 
the right timing, which is a golden opportunity, the tactics. I want you to start thinking about it because I want, when I finish ta talking, I want you and I to explore what are some of the tactics we can use because the timing is perfect. Why is it perfect? Because we are the boss of the people that wants to get elected. Soon, maybe you have experienced it, you have people coming to your door. Hi, my name is Joe or Josephine Candidate. I want you to vote for me, right? It's going to happen more and more. Just wait till September comes. Your door, there will be lots of door knocking. Oh, yeah. Some of you might be knocking on doors too, huh? And that's the time when they come to apply for the job. You're the boss. They're applying for a job. You can say, yes, we'll give you the job, or no, we won't give you the job. Guess what? When you're interviewing people, when there's a job interview, which is this period, they listen to you because you can decide not to hire them, which is what an MP, a member of parliament is going to do. They're going to come to you and say, uh, can I have a job, please? Would you elect me? That's what your vote is about. You are saying yes or no to whichever candidate that you want. So this is the time when they really have to listen. So, there's, so in terms of tactics, the timing is good. But you may say, what are we asking for? Right? It sounds so complicated. Well, it's not that complicated. Something very straightforward and simple. Canada needs quality childcare that all families can afford. Okay? That's pretty easy. Canada needs quality, remember? Not not bad stuff. Good quality. Quality childcare that all families, all, not just, not just the people that have money, can afford. You can almost replace that and say, you know, it wasn't that long ago. There were people that had vision. I think Tommy Douglas might be one of, the, one of them. That said, Canada needs quality health care that all families can afford. In fact, it wasn't even just families. All can afford. So if you replace that word child with health, that's exactly what we're talking about. We've done it before. We can do it again. And the time is right now. So Canada needs quality child care, now that we've got health care, that all families can afford. That is what we are asking for. And the federal government must come to the table with long-term funding. We said that, right? So they may say, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll do that, but, well, where's the money? The irony of it is this. When the conservative government said, we will give you quality child care. Well, how? We will give you an allowance. It's called universal. Amazing they use this word. Are we talking about universal child care? They are calling it universal child care. Not a plan, not a system, not a service. Allowances. They're going to give you some bucks. And you go and buy child care. What if there isn't any? I want to buy an iPhone 7. It's not in the market. How am I going to buy it? You can give me all types of money. I can't buy an iPhone 7. Don't have it. I can line up all I want. I, it's just not available. Okay? You can give me as much money as you want. Ain't going to happen. Um, so what is our message? Our message is pretty straightforward. Okay, we know what we're asking for, right? Quality child care that all can afford. Well... What's our message? Well, the child care is good for the economy. People said, ah, you know, it's just family. No, it's good for the economy. Why? Because mom and dad would be able to work without having to take sick day, without having to worry. And if they have a little bit of money left over by the end of the month, you know what? They're going to go buy things. They're going to go to the restaurant and eat. That generates the small businesses that spur growth. One of the reasons why Canada's growth in terms of our GDP, it doesn't go very far. Why? Well, because 
families can't afford to spend that much money because they all the money have gone to childcare, right? If you, it's good for the economy, it's good for the families, and because of that, it's good for Canada. Economy, families, Canada. That is our key message. So, what are the parties? Oh, I should have put that in blue, but it wouldn't show up. Conservative, the federal budget, what did it say? The income splitting. They want to give families where one spouse earns a lot of money, the second spouse didn't earn as much. They want to allow the one spouse to split fund money to the second spouse, and therefore, as a result, you pay less taxes, okay? Something like that. Expand the, what's UCCB? Universal Child Care Benefits. Uh, it's not really a child care, but they call it that way anyway. I call it mother allowance, because way back when we had mother allowance. And then child care expense deduction. You can de uh, deduct it um, in your income tax. Where are the parties on child care? The NDP, very clear. Not $100 a day, $15 a day, max. Might even be lower, but not higher than $15. How many more new spaces? A million new spaces within eight years. That there will be legislation, there will be cost sharing with the provincial and territorial governments. They would have benchmark, i.e. report cards, you know, when you study. You don't write an exam, you don't have any report cards, you don't know whether the quality is high or not, right? We said high quality. That's why this public reporting benchmark is really important. Healthcare has it, they can have it better, but at least there's a clause in the Healthcare Act that talk about that. It also reversed the income splitting that, that the Conservatives just um, introduced yesterday and retain the full mother allowance. The Liberals, they haven't said anything yet. No platform. We think they may want to put in that all affordable, high quality childcare space in every region, that they would play some national leadership role. We don't know. I'm just maybe dreaming out loud. We don't know. To reverse income splitting, but no commitment regarding what to do with that mother allowance. The Greens, they want to restore the 2005, there were multilateral framework agreements, sorry, bilateral agreement between the federal government and, and different provinces and territories. They want, uh, she wants to restore that, and then, uh, which will provide for childcare. In fact, I think the Greens support income splitting, I'm not 100% sure, and they would direct tax credit to employers, $1,500, per child for workplace child care. That's a good thing, but still, where are you going to create child care? Um, so right now there's national campaigns going on. People are huddling. Oh, football players, just like huddling. They're huddling, they're talking about some of the key actors that are huddling are here in this room, actually. You know, we introduce them later on. But there, there, was a, there was a campaign mostly by unions, laborers, that talk about, it's called Rethink Campaign, and then Child Care 2020 is collaboration with a lot of national groups, and that involved with some unions, Unifor, QP, uh, the uh, Canadian Policy Alternative, Canadian Council for Social Development, and some child care uh, national groups. The campaign goal is to win the vision of a national child care program in 2015, elect a government that say yes for quality child care that all families, well, quality child care that all families can afford. I'm trying to get you to memorize this by, by the end of my lecture. To unite and build the child care movement, including so that there's next generation of new leaders and by working together to make sure that child care is a key issue. So when they're knocking on your doors going, I need your vote. Well, are you going to vote for child care or not? If you're not, sorry. Okay? And what can you do? We can explore that. I want you to think about that question, not just what's in here. Maybe join a group, think of something creative, petition. We have copies of petition here. We
Of course, we bought petitions. Don't leave without signing. We have a flyer to talk about a week where we're going to take action. We'll explore that. It'll be May 10th to May 17th, a national week for child care. And those are the, some of the things that you can do uh, and starting right now at this forum. Ah, what is that? That's when you hire that member of parliament. Okay? That's the time when you say yes and no to, to uh, the people coming to you, which is the election time. And uh, during that period, I, our message is vote for childcare, for a stronger economy, for a better Canada. Remember we said that it is really good for the economy, good for families, and good for Canada. So we are saying vote for a stronger economy, for a better Canada. And it's about the kind of Canada we want, one that we are proud of. That is what we are pushing for. So, are you ready for it? Yeah. Oh, come on. Better than that. Are you ready for a national child care program? Yes, come on. I know you just had lunch. Let me try this again. Are you ready for a national child care program? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask you questions on how we are going to... Oh, how do I escape? How are, we'll just unplug this thing, wouldn't I? Just, okay, no. Turn off the power. That would blow the place up. No, we won't do that. Um, may I trouble you to turn it off? Yeah, I'm done. Uh, well, we're going to be proud of Canada. And if you can turn the lights off so I can stand right here. This is Lorraine, by the way, to help set us up. A big round of applause for Lorraine. Thank you. And uh, we can turn it down. Okay. Tactics. What are some of the ideas? Richard, you have an idea. You have a question. Question first. Yes. I, I, I want to say something to you which is very interesting. Yeah, I'm shutting down. Yeah, okay. Canada yes. put out something since 1867 called the Canada Yearbook. Okay. In the Canada Yearbook of 1920, there's a statement that goes like this. No country is advanced where children die debtors to society. They were talking about high infant mortality rates, 1920. Mm -hmm. If you look at this from the point of view of not just child care, but a human resources strategy, that is to say, we want to put people to work so they make money. Right. Right, and that give you income for housing and all the other things you want in life. If people die early, you don't have a productive society. So the interesting thing about childcare here too though, from the cradle to the grave, the earlier you support childcare, the more advanced human resources you're developing. So it can be looked at that way. And what the Canada Yearbook was talking about, economic development. Now what you need, and by the way, the, the Kennedy Johnson sort of a thing was essentially a human resource strategy. Exactly. Where you talk about on the potential of the economy, the potential labor force. If you look at kids then as the most important potential you have in the society, then that's why you want to advocate better child care and do that. On a, from a capitalist point of view, not what the Americans are saying, but supporting it from the point of view of capitalism. Okay. So that's another way of looking at it. Good, good. If you want a better economy, it's important that, yes, this, it's important that we make sure that we have better childcare. Some of the tactics, any suggestions? Because we have this unique opportunity. And because you're still taping, I'm wondering whether we can take the mic and put it over here. So when you speak, she, she's able to tape you. Yeah, bring the mic up. Come all the way up here. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. You're not shy. No, I'm not. I'm just following so, the mic. <laughs> yeah. So that would allow 
our person that's doing the filming okay, to show not your back but your front. That's great. Better looking. Appreciate that. It's okay. Better. Thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for better TV. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. That was really incredible. And I think it kind of framed the child care issue in a really relevant way. And, you know, I watched the budget yesterday and it was pretty inspiring to see uh, the fact that child care was at the top of the agenda, which I think, you know, for so many folks who have been following this recently or for a long time, that's pretty unprecedented, right? To have two of the major parties putting out platforms, albeit very different visions of what childcare can look like, but they, they were talking about it. I was following the tweeting and we have uh, one of our leading childcare experts in the country, Martha Friendly here, she was live tweeting the budget with a frame on how it actually addresses the childcare need. And the fact that, you know, we had so many people responding to her messages saying, you know, UCCB income splitting, it's just a drop in the bucket and what we actually need is a national child care program. That's a hugely inspiring moment for us and when you're talking about timing, that particularly resonates because I'm supporting the Vote Child Care campaign. So the message is really simple. When you make that choice at the ballot box, child care should be a top priority for us. It should be top of our agenda, not just because it's personal or singular, but it is about the kind of Canada that we want, one that takes care of each other and that sees it from all the different perspectives, from a capitalist, from an ec uh, economic perspective, from a social cohesion perspective. There's so many different ways that child care benefits, and it also benefits gender equality. We're talking about the role of women in the economy, the role of families, of parents having those options, and that's why you know we can drive and connect child care to so many different aspects of the issues that we care about and that this election there is a moment and I think we're all feeling it to take advantage of it. So I know Olivia shared a little flyer about the Vote Child Care campaign and we do have a week of action coming up. It's May 10th to 17th. Uh, Mother's Day falls in that. The International Day of Families fall in that. And we're seeing, you know, different movements and groups from across the country engaging in different ways. Some of them are hosting talks like this, you know, having little coffee parties at your house, inviting your neighbors to talk about the child care issue, or bigger things. We have a stroller brigade that's being organized stroller in brigade? Va Vancouver. Whoa, whoa. Tell yeah, me about the, I like the word brigade, okay? Well, just so I can just image exactly it. exactly how you imagine it. Parents, child care workers, educators, uh, community members, like, like grandparents and aunts and uncles. I'm an aunt, so it's it's very close to my heart. Can I go borrow um, a stroller? Absolutely, yes. I'm sure you have some neighbors who would be happy to lend, lend one to you. And really making a statement, making a parade, making it a bit of a celebration of what is possible when we work together. Um, so the, Can the we have balloons? More yes, and there's actually uh, one of our one of our national organizers is working on a balloon distribution and connecting a message to that balloon. And you go out in the community oh. and you hand that out at a park, right? There's a lot of really creative ways of being able to connect and meet people where they're at, and that's the kind of ideas that we're pulling together. And I'm sure that there's many more in this room. Um, so we'll hand out the flyer, and it's votechildcare.ca. You can sign up for the list. There's also a bunch of resources there. About about you know, ideas for what you can do in the week of action and how you can get involved. And we'll also circulate that sign-up sheet that Olivia was mentioning because you're all here and if we can connect you with the information that you need to feel inspired about what can happen. You know, a campus is a really exciting place to have a lot of these conversations and raise the issue of child care and how it connects to all the other things that we care about. And we have a moment coming up in May to be able to do that, leading towards the federal election in October and getting that message out so that when the candidates do come knocking at our doors we uh, we know exactly what to ask them and what we're looking for in their answers too so thank you again and we'll s send around some of that uh, information and sorry for taking so so long at the mic uh, you. introduce yourself introduce yourself and my name is Asma Malik a school trustee in Toronto, in Toronto just elected uh, yeah, I uh, I'm seizing the microphone uh, to be a wet blanket here I'm sorry University policy, I am reminded, requires us only to show on camera people who have agreed to be on camera. Uh, sign and release. rather than asking people to sign a waiver before they ask their question, I'm going to move the camera or, or the microphone out Back of there. camera. Back there. Oh, OK. Voices are OK. It's faces that ah, privacy law does not okay. want Okay, we'll see your back. 
Uh, but since I'm at the microphone, let me ask <laughs> a question before I move the microphone. Okay. You, you talked about the importance of speaking to candidates when they come knocking at our door during the election. And it's really a timing question. Is that too late? It is. Should we not have been getting it into party platforms before the election rather than talking to people after their platforms are set? A very good question. Very good question. Well, let me ask you this question. How do you get the public attention? How would you do that? What would be the tactics you want to use in order to say to the liberals, you need to make sure that you have a platform before you start your campaign so that we are very clear what you plan to do, because right now is not 100% clear, right? So any tactics, any suggestions on what we can do? Yeah. I see in the past, even now with the municipal election, even though the candidates are a specific platform, but because of uh, the pressure from the other candidates, they actually changed or adjust their platform. So that's why like uh, voice is very important when uh, uh, speaking about a cause. Yeah, y y well, we need to make sure that all the candidates that support childcare speak about it so that maybe whoever gets elected will take a page from the book of their opponent. I, hey, I give you a life example. My, our, our mayor, John Tory, during election said, oh, you can't get more better bus services. We don't have enough buses. There's no place to park them. He got elected and thought, oh, this is a good idea. We'll have more bus services. We can buy them. We can lease a place to park them. No, no, he's doing it. Good, it's good. I don't mind. It's a good thing to do. That if the idea is good, please take it. Right? That makes for a good government. You have a suggestion? Yes. Um, just get up here. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, well, my name is Bezad. I'm a teaching assistant at York University. I'm also a graduate student here. Uh, I first want to thank you for coming. It's an honor and a privilege to listen to you, and this is a really important issue for um, everyone, but especially at York University. Um, I also want to thank you uh, for rescheduling your event because, as you know, your event was rescheduled because of a strike, and uh, part of the events that we had in QP3903, which I'm part of, was, guess what? More childcare benefits and funds for students at York University. That is something that we uh, won, uh, so tens and tens and thousands of dollars or more added to the funding, existing funding already at York University. That's something that we achieved. And my suggestion is that we should coordinate with local uh, communities and local groups uh, and, and the unions, existing, as you said, integrate um, also those unions within schools that are, fun, like that are fighting for childcare. Uh, that's something that, because Let's face it, we don't have many friends and many allies at the conservatives and liberal government. Uh, we got to go back to our communities, to, to working people, to, um, to our unions who are representing the working people, who are the people who need childcare, because the rich can afford it, obviously. They don't need a national um, you know, childcare act. They need more tax cut for them, and the conservatives are representing those uh, interests. So let's go back to our unions, let's go back to our communities and make sure that they're also on board with what we are asking, and they also give us all the support we want. So that's one suggestion when I... What can uh, you do I, to help on that? Well, I was part of the organizing the strike, and uh, one of the most important demands that we had was uh, childcare. So. I was part of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still active in, in, in the QP 3903, and we'll keep fighting for this, and uh, I'll continue, um, sort of continuing my activities around not only childcare, but also around a whole of other issues that, you know, families um, worry about. Um, Can we call on you to part, be part of the team? Absolutely. Okay. You know, sign, sign, me <laughs> sign me up. Sign me up. Okay. And and this is important. It's it's and you mentioned how important it is because childcare. It's not only childcare that has been commercialized and commodified, but it's also our education. It's also social housing. 
you know, I know 17,000 people are waiting uh, for, for childcare, but over 100,000 people are waiting for social housing. That's an important, uh, you know, social right and fundamental human rights that affects families, affects working families. So we also should, you know, make sure that uh, the new Democrats and in you know, the more progressive uh, parties also do make that a priority. So childcare, social housing, and education, things that NDP has stood for historically. Um, one comment I had about, um, you know, the election coming up. Um, I just want to ask, if 75% if of people, you know, repeatedly have said they're for childcare, if similar numbers are, uh, you know, for social housing, for making education more affordable and accessible, why are we not winning elections? What's the reason that NDP keeps not winning elections? And what can we do to help making that happen? If people are on board, what's missing? What's missing from NDP actually representing the power it has and the people it, it's representing? Mm -hmm. So that's my question. Thank you so much. Well, the, yes, 70% plus of people uh, people want to have a national child care program. The question is whether it's vote determining or not. That for parties that feel that they don't need to say a whole lot about child care, that if they call it child care, you see, the UCCB, Universal Child Care Benefits, unless you attended this course or this, this lecture, you look at the title, gee, the word childcare is in it. Oh, the government must really support childcare. Look how much money they're putting in. They're putting in $2 billion when they first started. I think it's going to go up to like $5 billion plus or something, something like that. Um, wow, they're putting in $5 billion for childcare. They must really, really believe in childcare. Well, actually, most of that money um, goes, especially with income splitting, which is really expensive. Half of the people that are going to get that funds don't have kids in childcare. And by and large, 85% of the people that benefit are people that have a lot of money. So, but that's pretty complicated. At election time, when things are pretty simple, you can say that, yeah, well, the fact that the conservative put in that much money onto something they call child care tells you that the public wants to have it. It's just that they haven't quite distinguished the fact that having money in your pocket doesn't mean that you get the service, right? You can have all the money you want. If the service is not available, you still have to line up at 2 a.m. in the morning to get on the waiting list for a spot. So, um, but as to how we can do it, that's really a strategy question, which is what I'm asking. What are some of the tactics that can think creatively, that can capture the imagination of the people to say, wait a second, yeah, we need that service, not just that money. Most of the people don't get money anyway. Okay. Some suggestions, questions. Um, right, I, um, I'll skip the preamble and jump straight to the question, which I- Speak louder, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll skip the preamble. So my question is this. One of the stumbling blocks to realizing national childcare concerns over the standardization of thought. And um, more specifically, some would call it, um, <laughs> some would call it indoctrination in children. But I think that's a, a, a necessarily paranoid of putting the question. However, I think the question remains, which is, given given the diverse needs of the you know families and uh, parents of different backgrounds in Canada, how would a universal childcare um, be able to accommodate that if it would be able to do that at all? That's an excellent question. Uh, there are several questions like, you know, this is intruding in family matters, mm -hmm. parents knows best, and 
standard, one size fit all, doesn't work. I totally agree. That's why I'm not saying the federal government should go and deliver childcare. We don't want that. We think that childcare should be developed by the community, by the parents, okay? So if you look at a good childcare program right here in Toronto, let's say in Scarborough, Melbourne area, very good childcare program. Why? The board of directors of the childcare centers are organized by parents. And the parents, because they're in Scarborough Roosh River, very diverse, Chinese, Tamils, whichever background, okay? They come together to form a board of director of a childcare center and, as, and then they determine who they hired. And so the program, may I get the sound person to uh, get rid of the buzz, please? Thank you, thank you. It's really um, not quite working. I haven't done anything. Maybe I mentioned a bad word. I don't know. So what we are talking about is the federal government providing a framework to say quality childcare and the funding. But in terms of delivery, I'll use the city as an example. It's delivered by the city of Toronto. The city of Toronto, pretty diverse place, okay? You vote for them. And they provide the funding also from the federal government to the province and province to the city. The city then say to the group of parents that form a child care board of director, the center, well, you have the funds, you go and operate it. So in that way, it's very bottom up. It's not actually managed by the federal government. But what the federal government have to do is not to walk away and say we, have, we don't play any role. Why? Because half of your taxes, those of you that pay taxes, goes to the federal government. If, you, if they take your money, they take your taxes, then they have a responsibility to use it properly, to use it in a way that works. So in that way, the transfer of the funds and setting national standard is what's needed, not the delivery system. Does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah? I, I, Dern and I wrote a book, Canadian Public Policy, 1983. One of the biggest problems is to get people into government agenda documents. We think of the speech from the throne, the revenue budget, and the expenditure plan as theoretical issues. Come closer to the mic. You yes, can even I, kiss it. I'm him. saying that we think of... Okay, good. Oh, it works. Uh, it's yes. much better. But come yeah. back to it, though. We think of the revenue budget, the speech from the throne, and the expenditure plan as if they're really just theoretical documents. But what you're discussing here is the issue of how you get these into the government agenda items. Now, yes, you want to get that into political party platforms like the Red Book and all of that stuff. And he's right when he says at election time, it's almost too late to do it. You want to mobilize that support ahead of time, these ideas. Now, it's interesting, the book, the subtitle was Ideas, Structure, Process. What are you talking about here are values. How mm -hmm. do we change ideas in society, especially ideas that are directed at improving human resources? So we want to get these kind of ideas that what, uh, and by the way, you people are basically actors in the system that you want to move it from the university to the public. Because again, I suppose we wrote a book and a few people in university read it and take course and pass exams. But it was really intended for people to better understand. You know what some of my students told me? They went into the basement of the library at the University of Guelph. They didn't know that something called the Canada Yearbook existed. Mm -hmm. It says all kinds of things about Canada. By the way, and used to come out every year. 
with all kinds of information about what governments are doing and not doing. And by the way, right. one of the greatest things that Trudeau government did, when we could get information Canada free, Nowadays, if you want government information, you have to pay for it. You have to it. pay. But I, Richard, let me take what you said. I don't think it's not just intellectual knowledge. I want to challenge all of you that unless you are motivated from the heart, it's not going to work. Because intellectual knowledge, and Martha Friendly is going to come and talk a bit about how to motivate speaking from one professor to another. Professor from, York, uh, from the U of T, I dragged her all up to say, come to York. So how do we take the ideas, right? The analytical idea and to then motivate it because people won't work. They're not going to take action and you, unless you have the head knowledge and the heart, which is motivation, then the action takes place, the hand comes out. So the question is, how do we motivate people well, that's why I use desperate. Maybe more stories, some stories. Well, Martha, do you want to talk a bit you, about that? I think that? you're both absolutely, absolutely. Uh, come closer to the mic, I too, I think though. you're both absolutely right. I think you need, like, I'm a policy researcher. So you have to take that and put it into terms that speak to people's values and how they feel. And having worked in this area, for, so I, I should just say, I mean, I got my real start in childcare as a parent at York University Cooperative Child Care Center. And that's when I really learned about what it actually is like to be a parent, what it's like to be in a child care center, because you had to participate in the center at the time that, that we were here. And so you have to bring these things to get, okay. Uh, I can, you, you have, but you also have to be, you know, you do need to know, for example, what, it, it's very useful to have the knowledge and transmit the knowledge to activists that quality is really important and that it's not worth fighting for childcare that's not good quality. Just as an example, there's a wealth of research that says that. The, the question, for example, the question that um, you asked, a very good question about how do you represent diversity in a system, you have to, you can look at um, early childhood programs comparatively and understand the ways that you can do that without imposing one size fits all, that you have diversified services, that you don't make it compulsory, that you give parents a voice even if they're public services, for example. So I think you have to have the knowledge, and childcare is very interesting because many different fields, disciplines, feed into it. You know, it, it's not just one thing. It's psychology and sociology and economics, history, all sorts Crime. of things. All these things, but unless you can really understand it and, and apply values to it and understand how parents feel and what it's like for children and what the educators, the workforce experience is, it doesn't add up to anything and you can't communicate. And I think that maybe that's what you're getting at. And so, you, you know, you have to kind of bridge, you have to bring everybody together, which is the researchers, the activists, and that's what we're trying to do in this national and, and campaign. And the moms that can, and the dads that can tell the story. So am I, can yeah. I ask you to tell, don't go, the story of what you did at York University back then? You were a mom, or you're about to be a mom? <laughs> tell yeah. us the story, I, hey, well, I don't know. I, well, okay, I mean, story so I, motivates people, right? What got you involved? Okay, so uh, before I immigrated to Canada in 1971, I actually worked on one of the first Head Start programs in the United States. I worked on the research, and I knew, my background's in psychology, so I knew about early a little bit about early childhood stuff. And I came to Toronto with a baby. My husband taught at York, still teaches at York. And um, I got to be a parent in the, it was a, an early, it was a hippie co-op, basically. Hippie co-op, did you it, hear it that? Was, it was, it was absolutely great. And the parents participated in the program How half a day a week. How old were your kid? Well, it was my first kid who's 43 and he was, he came to York daycare when I think he was 13 months old. So was the daycare, you started daycare? Did it, no, was it there started daycare? before me. But, but when we came, it got its first director the same week that we came. So it was really a co-op with no administration. It was in um, one of the old grad residences in the 
over in the Atkinson side, and then it moved um, when I met my friend Laurel Rothman here, also at York Daycare, another parent at York Daycare, and we met when it was moving to the Atkin where, it, where it is now, essentially. And it, what it did was give the parents, it, it's a very special kind of circumstance. It doesn't really exist anymore because there was so much parent involvement in the governance I, I don't really think that that model really exists anymore. And if, if I can really be truthful about it, I don't think you can apply that to the population at large and expect parents yeah. to all run their own childcare centers that way in order to get childcare. Oh, I, I know, I'm not trying to get you to analyze it. I'm trying to tell us t that when you first got to, when your husband started teaching at York, what was it like when you didn't have childcare and then discovered that oh. you do have child, you, you had childcare. And what was it like when your kid went to childcare here at York? I might, Tell I might, us that period that motivated yeah, you. Yeah, I, I actually stayed home for about a part of a year, and I, you know, I didn't. I, I thought my life was over. It took me a good year after I came here until I figured out that there was childcare, that, and this is true of a lot of parents, they don't even know what they're getting into. So what happened was I developed basically an extended family. Um, I don't think people recognize enough what a great time kids have in great childcare. It's something that you can't ignore. It's fantastic for them. They get friends. You mean the kid? What, the what's kids. your son's name? What? What's your kid's name? Ethan, that went to Ethan childcare. Friendly. That one went, that was my son, Ethan. And, you know, got friends, we got friends, we got a network, we got to know people. It sort of became an extended family. It was a very close kind of situation. And, but the real thing was I could go to work and we felt really comfortable because we knew that he was well taken care of. I think that's what parents can get from good childcare. Really understanding that their kids, and I should just you know, end this by saying, I'm now a grandmother. I have twin grandsons who are a little over two, and they have really great childcare in a municipal center downtown. And, um, they could never afford it if they didn't have a subsidy because they're not, no, there's nobody who is high income enough to pay for two toddlers in high cost, good quality childcare. So if you go back to that kind of system, how does it bring everybody in? It has to be everybody across the board. The only thing I didn't agree with you about is I think rich people should be in the same childcare system as everybody else. We don't want to bar rich people from our, from our universal childcare system. And I think that that's really the key. And I just want to link this back to values. In this campaign, because I'm really involved in, I was involved in, you know, in the Ch Childcare 2020 conference, I think it's really important to link the provision of childcare good quality universal child care to how we want Canada to be. It's the way you ended. It's the values that we have for the country and for our society. And I think that that's, you know, when you talk about it, how to make it, how to link it up in an election campaign to priorities, it is never going to be the highest priority if, it, if it's a standalone kind of service. It has to represent something is something more than just a place to put your kid. It has to be something about the way we think about ourselves, about the kind of society, you know, about inequality, about gender, about, you know, about social inclusion, about diversity, and bring all these things together into some kind of a vision, which is what we try to do. And I think that that's the only way we'll ever win. Can I come back to your story? Oh, yeah. Which, okay, sorry to do that. <laughs> Did you have to make a choice whether you were gonna stay home or that, that, uh, that you said, well, my, my son is gonna get into childcare. You make that decision. There was a challenge because at that time, you know, it wasn't clear. It, it, it was, it, it, no, it was clear to me, Olivia. To me, it wasn't a choice. I had to put up, so you think that back, this was the early 70s. I had to even put up with my mother being unsure about whether it was good for her grandchildren to go to childcare. But, but this was the early days. This was when women in the labor force were still a minority, less than 50%. But, you know, I was in the women's movement and I thought it was a really good thing and it never crossed my mind not to, 
you know, not to work. That's all. It just didn't cross my mind not to work. But I do think that that factor still hangs around for some uh, people. And I think that there are still values that mothers, that I don't think it's very predominant, but there's still some values that say, oh, maybe mothers shouldn't work. Maybe they should stay at home. But it's much less dominant than it was back in the 70s. That, and you, and that, you made that choice. And that almost determined your, the, your, the direction of your entire career path. Completely. It, I, it did. I, you know, it's, it's one of those serendipitous things where you think, oh, this is really interesting. I never heard of social policy before. I was in psychology and I was American, where they didn't have much social policy. So, you know, if you sort of think about it, I really understood, I came, sort of came to understand how it was structured. All the stuff you're saying, what's the role of the federal government? What's the role of the provinces? What happens if you do things locally? That's the policy side. But um, I think it was learning all that by being involved in it, that, the, that if, if that is really what the story of York Daycare was. So Thank you. that's the story. Can I say just another thing? Thank you. I'm going to get other people that haven't spoken yet. So no, the, the answer is I want to hear from people. I want to hear specifically some stories of waiting for childcare or had childcare and it was excellent. I'm what not, was your experience and what go strategy through, to use? I'm not going to go through that route because the political stories bore me to death. I hate when Obama pulled out Joe the plumber. And, and it's like, as a voter, I'm like, OK, I get there are those stories, but I want to get to other. It just, he got it just elected. takes us away from. I, I, want, I want to go back to what uh, Richard, Richard and Martha yeah. were saying. And this idea of a narrative of the good society and values, values around right now, the idea of child care is couched too deeply in preaching to the choir. The people mm -hmm. that have come out to hear you, families with kids, students who are writing papers, professors who are teaching the subject, and I just want to play devil's advocate for a moment and say, if we really thought about this issue as human rights, children's rights, and we really framed it in a way that people like me, and I, I'm only going to use this as an example, I don't really feel this way because, you know, I teach in the subject, but I have been to many events where childless, single women and men are marginalized from this. When I see stroller brigade, I'm thinking those crazy kids in stroller, you know the $900 strollers that run you over? Um, no, now I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm being, I'm being that person that says, it's your kid, take care of it. All Because this is the real narrative that's out there that we need to overcome. We need to get to a place where child care is not just parents sitting on boards. There are many people who can sit on boards who don't necessarily have children. I, I want to sort of find a way that we can speak to this about an, a national narrative, an ethos of caring about our citizens regardless of what your family does or doesn't look like. Can you offer me uh, some suggestions on what what that yeah, might be? Yeah, I mean, I always start with this notion of education, and sometimes starting at the university level can be too late. I really think within primary and secondary schools, we should already be ta talking about human rights that includes, you know, uh, child care. Mm -hmm. um, questions of, you know, that we did during women's movements, where we thought having women at work is not just about women's rights, it's about human rights, because we build stronger societies when you have more people to to in the working pool. Um, there are ways of, of bringing up these conversations so that it's not just what parents need or what people with children need, um, because other people start to feel like they don't belong in that conversation, mm -hmm. unless, of course, they've educated in it or really care strongly about a stronger Canada. Um, so the idea is how do you uh, build and write and teach that says, Hey, you might not agree with you know the LGBTQ community or whatever it is, but let me show you how this creates a better Canada, including children's rights. Then how do we reach out to those single people that you're talking about, or the other people? Don't call it a stroller brigade because I don't own one. <laughs> no, I just want to borrow one. Yeah. Uh, just, well, <laughs> but that's the don't. What should no. we do in order to connect more to yeah. other people? Yeah, it, it, part of it is that larger conversation about this is not about you or whether you have a child or not. Get out of that it's space that it's about individual rights. Um, think of it as something bigger that promotes the country that you believe in, right? Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Work for it. Pull it up. Um, other. Oh, you you've been waiting. Yes. I want to hear. For, yeah. Hi, hi, Olivia. So the pub, um, the topic of affordable child care is really close to my heart because I have three little ones still under ten. So I have three girls, eight, four, and two. And uh, within the last three, four years, Come I've gone through. To the mic. Yeah. I've gone through quite a a very tiring journey to find not only affordable childcare, but quality childcare. Um, I live in the Brampton, Peel, Mississauga region of Toronto, and even there is a, a huge issue for a lot of um, parents that are in similar situation as mine. So my, when I was pregnant with my second child, um, even before she was born, I went through the whole wait list Thing. People would tell me, get on the wait list now before the baby comes. You might just get in with a really good childcare. And then she came. I didn't have uh, a childcare facility. And I went into the home daycare scenario where I was searching relentlessly for a quality home daycare provider. I went through all the different agencies, didn't find one. I interviewed close to 40 individuals, myself. Four zero? Four zero. Wow. And my list, my checklist, I carried my checklist, I asked them a million questions. That was a lot of hours and time spent just looking for a childcare provider. Uh, my husband and I contemplated one of us should stay home. That wasn't feasible, raising two children. Um, and we just got our first home together. So just the, the very process of going through and looking for quality child care was just arduous. Needless to say, luckily, I applied for subsidy and got a little subsidy through the city. But still, it wasn't sufficient. So my main thing that I want to point out is... What did you is, do? Well, we ended up getting a home daycare provider because we couldn't afford one that was regulated by the city. And when we were thinking of having additional children, we went through a lot of, a, lo a huge discussion on whether we can afford it, a third child, how we're gonna make things, like how we're gonna make ends meet. Um, at the time, my husband had gotten laid off. So there was a lot of e e economical challenges that we had to think through. Um, so now the third child's here and we're still doing the home daycare stuff. Um, I was fortunate enough to find one that we felt comfortable with, but just the entire process of having to interview that many individuals. And um, the system, I think one of the main things is perceptions need to change. I think we live in a society that's not child-centered. We, like for example myself, just being here as an employee, formerly was a student and now I'm an employee here, had had to take quite a lot of time off within the last three years just to you know, be at home when my kids got sick. And that posed a problem. Uh, it's, it's having that struggle between whether you can be at work, can be a you know, reliable employee, or be a parent. You're always having that internal struggle of whether you should work or be a mother. And the perception is that it's only a woman's role to be a parent or, or to be at home with the children has to change. Um, and luckily, my husband is very progressive thinking. And <laughs> He took the time that he was off work to spend quality time with the kids and to actually get to appreciate the amount of time and energy I spend, not just after I, you know, I come home from my first job to my second job, but also just the, the, the amount of time it takes just to you know, prepare the kids for the day. And, and just, you know, he did this live at home dad scene for at least six months and really grew to understand what it is like to be a full-time parent because a lot of you know unpaid labor i mean i could tell you i mean you guys probably all know oh no they, they will maybe one day experience it 
Any dad you know, out when there? When you yet? become no, parents, no, not yet. I think they're but young. Yeah. I think it's the perception, and and also, not just from the parental or the societal level, but from a employment spec uh, perspective. Because of the sick days. Sick, yes, exactly. Days to be more working. understanding of that, you know, yeah. the internal struggle that parents have to constantly, should I stay home or should I go to work? Who would, and I, I mean, no, no child care facility will take a child if they're really sick. So one of the parents are going to have to stay home, st remain at and home. That's why it hurts yeah. the economy. Yeah. Right? So that's if you have exactly, a good child care program, it's better what, for the economy. Exactly. So that's my story, and I just wanted to share that. But I got involved with the school on the school level, and I'm part of the, one of the school boards within the region. So get involved, get your voice heard, you know, just become part of the, of the community that your child or children or families are involved. Get involved. That's my strategy. Thank you. Strategy. Thank you. Other strategy. Okay. Uh, we have two or three more speakers. And come on over. Just come. Make it, uh, we have to leave in a f ten, five minutes, ten minutes or so. That's okay, Olivia. Yeah. I'll be uh, really quick. I just wanted to speak uh, to the comment about engaging uh, people who don't have children or who aren't uh, specifically connected to the issue. Um, the Canadian Labour Congress has taken up child care as one of their key issues uh, with their election campaign. And uh, one of the messages that they're using is that everybody depends, we all depend on somebody who depends on child care. Uh, like, what, what do you do? Are you a professor here? So you're an employee at York. You do something that the students here and the faculty here depend on you to do, and without childcare, kind of limits your uh, ability to do that. And so when you're talking to people who don't have children, kind of putting it that way and then engaging them kind of from, from that angle uh, is usually where I, where I come, come at it from. So. But she left. So if you guys see the woman who made that comment, uh, you can just let her know. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll tell that professor. Thanks. And uh, some more comments. Come on, and, and this gentleman after you. Hi, thanks again for coming in. Um, I just had a quick comment and then a follow-up question. Uh, my comment was in regards, to, again, to the changing perception and the changing narrative to address more people. And the way I look at childcare is, it should be something that can, we, we need to send the message out that giving childcare not only takes care of the, the child, but it gives women the equal opportunity to have that freedom to work. I mean, that's something that applies to me as a, as a graduate student right now. My next concern is finding a job, and then the next concern after that is being able to balance the work and life, um, um, balance work and life. And so when I think about childcare, I mean, not only should we concentrate on afford, uh, making it more affordable, but of course quality is really important. And the case that I look at is Quebec, for instance, where the $5 a day, great, it works, and it was really, really effective in um, allowing more parents to afford it. I mean, it ex the expansion of the service was good, but I mean, the quality was poor, and some of the studies that were conducted, it, it showed that um, they showed a lot of aggressiveness in younger kids and that kind of translated into the dynamics of the family. Um, so that's something that was important to me and I think that kind of narrative where we can include just giving women that opportunity to have that flexibility to work or not. Because I mean, we've, we're, we're addressing some issues where there's that conservative thought of mind where maybe women should stay at home, maybe parents are the actual true best providers of uh, childcare. But I mean, reality today is that you don't have that much of a choice to make that decision. Reality today has changed. I mean, it's not more about of should parents stay home or work. They but can't. They don't, they don't earn enough money. To exactly. Have one, the one reality today home. is to make it not a substitute, but make it a compliment. Make child care a compliment to your everyday um, responsibilities. Um, so my question was, going back to the Quebec case, um, how do we have that trust in government to make the right dis to use that money? I mean, we pay taxes and we expect to get good services, but I mean, I think personally for me, the the, the lack of trust in this in the government is what kind of puts me a step behind and makes me re rethink about what kind of childcare policy that I would support. Um, so, how do we sort of address that into building more trust in the government? Per se, and this is uh, you know it's a much much larger issue. But I mean I think that comes down to something that I would con reconsider, um, because I mean having a good policy, it's important, not just the the the, the underlying issue. All right. Well, right now there's a perception that 
Um, I'll just use myself as an example. Oh, go! Cool. I'm a recovering politician. I'm no longer a politician. <laughs> that politicians are scumbags. They are, you know, sleazy. They pocket their money and they waste money. They they cheat. They lie. They will say anything to get elected. They will make promises and then they break them even before you blink. Uh, and as a result, if you look at the turnout rate, drop, drop, dropping. Especially for young people, it's dropping faster. Then you know what? People that have power, they will just keep the power because they want you to believe that no matter what you do, it won't make any difference. They want you to believe that the government is always going to be bad for you. Therefore, you need a smaller government, i.e., no government. But they'll pocket your taxes anyway. It's just give it to the right, pe the wrong type of people who don't need the money. The people that really need the money. Like the family, your family, that can need really affordable, high-quality childcare are not getting it. And I think government that don't want change, that don't want progress, these folks will tell you, don't ever trust anyone. Don't bother voting. You're not going to make a difference. They're all corrupt. And guess what? Then they continue to get reelected. And we will never make change. What progressive is all about, who are progressives? People that believe in progress, moving forward. We haven't had change for 20, 30 years on a whole lot of things, building affordable housing, better affordable childcare, all those things, protect the environment, all those things that when you ask around us, we all agree on, you know why? Because we have not been able to make progress because we're told that we can't. So the key thing is A, believe that you can, B, stop the people that tell you that they, you can't, and then go and work harder than they do, smarter, then you can make change. Then we will have progress. If not, we'll be stuck in neutral, stuck in the bad old days all the time. So have faith, have hope. Just a very brief, but I think very important point to make. Um, I can't even have a conversation about policy, and many of the people that, well, many of my relatives can't have a conversation about policy, when 38% of the vote will get you 100% of the power in our parliament. Mm -hmm. um, so many times I've asked my parents, since I was young, who are you going to vote for? Automatically it's the liberals, because they have the best chance of defeating the conservatives. Uh, so just what do you have to say about that, this move away from first past the post towards a fairer electoral system? Well, you see, 62% of the people did not vote for the party that's in power. They have 100% of, uh, of the power. That's why uh, in 2009, I think, remember there was this coalition government thing, that fellow called Jack Layton, said to Stefan Dion, who said, yes, we'll do a coalition government. Then Michael Inadiev became the leader and said, no, we can just do it by ourselves. You know, when we come together, we are stronger. So I think it's really important. If anyone say that they can do it alone, it's not good enough. If we're going to make progress, we need to come together, right? So I'm a firm believer of coalition government. If you believe in similar things, unless they don't believe in the National Child Care Program, that's a separate story. If they believe in the same thing, then come together and work it out, right? Working together. In fact, you teach that in child care. You play together, you work together, you get become a good person. Same lessons. So number one, work together, have a coalition government. Number two, first past the post doesn't work. We need to make sure every vote counts. And for that to happen, we need proportional representation. We need a party that believes in proportional representation so that we would actually have a system like everywhere else in the world, except three big countries, Canada, US, and Britain, so that it's no longer just you get 38%, 39% of the vote, you get 100% of the power because it's just not fair.
One more question, Laura. Oh, great! Just, you just have one to find suggestion. A word. Um, my name is Laurel Rothman. I also was a parent with Martha at York University Daycare in the early Welcome 70s. Home. <laughs> Any rate, here's a thought: as we've all collected lots of energy, information, ideas, you're an important big community here on this campus. About 50,000 people. If you even could do a small action the week of May 10th, maybe it's a leaflet that says, what did you say, uh, Lindsay? Everybody, rel everyone depends on someone who depends on childcare. Maybe it's a stroller brigade, maybe it's not. But think about whether anybody here could take some leadership. I'm gonna look at my uh, colleague here from uh, I believe it's the Graduate Assistance, Assistance Union or one of them or one of the uh, or important organized groups and say, you know, do that and try to meet with your local MP. It's not a big deal. I think it's Who's the Judy Scro. Is it Judy Scro? I don't know who it is. I think it's Judy Scro who's a, a, a liberal. In any case, um, and connect up with the campaign. That would be great if you could do it. I know it may be exam week, may not work, but it, you know, keeping the issue on the radar screen is also important. Thanks. Okay, let me ask you the last question before I leave the mic. If someone take the initiative, the two of you, yes. yeah, look at, you, can, you two can look at each other. A mom with three kids, you know, and a veteran organizer. Now, if you two decide to get together and organize some kind of activity, whatever it might be, I'm sure it's creative, it's action-oriented, it's exciting, it's fun. It needs to be fun, okay? It's gonna be fun. How many of you would come out to a fun and creative and exciting event sometime in May? Come on, all right, thank you so much. Thank you for your attention today. Good luck. Um, on behalf of uh, all of our co-sponsors and everyone here, I'd like to thank Olivia Chow for, for her public lecture on affordable child care now. Um, thank you for raising this critically important public policy issue for us today here at York University. Uh, it's astonishing to me as a Canadian that we do not have a national child care program. Um, and I think you're absolutely right to point out, Olivia, that people are desperate. Families, as you showed us in your slides, are waiting in the bitter cold just to get on a waiting list to uh, get some sort of childcare support. And when you see photographs such as Alicia and Kay Lee, it really uh, drives that particular message home. It's also astonishing to me when a public policy concern like this is so obviously beneficial economically, in terms of social cohesion, in terms of helping us build the kind of society we would like to have here in Canada, that we do not have a national policy framework with sustainable funding available. And I think you're absolutely right. We have at a juncture now this is a golden opportunity for all of us to realize something that we should have in place. And yes, a affordable national child care policy program can be achieved by 2020. Promises have been made in the past, as you pointed out. But your voice, Olivia, in this particular public arena or not only in this area, but in the public arena is vitally important. Your enthusiasm, your dedication, your commitment is inspirational. And your continued leadership on this issue and other social justice issues and concerns is vitally important. So thank you for staying involved and for your commitment and dedication. And quite frankly, uh, I don't think, David, we could have had a better person coming here who not only is an inspirational speaker, but 
through her life work, has dedicated herself in terms of critical public policy analysis. Your activism, your engagement in society is an example for all of us and all the students here at York University. So I hope you'll continue to come back to York and continue to inspire all of us. And please, on behalf of all of us, accept what Master Leighton Brown likes to say is the most coveted item here at York University. And the only way that you can actually get this most coveted item is to be a speaker here at McLaughlin College. So on behalf of all of us, please accept this as a token of our appreciation. Please join me in thanking Olivia for joining us. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And it is a good time to use this. I know what it is. <laughs> Thank you. And if I am free, I hope I can join you if you have an event. Okay? Thank you again. Take care.